as that character is concerned that you don't often see. So I thought her performance is interesting, even though it's not enough for me to recommend that movie unless you're like a Kristen Stewart obsessed bisexual person. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of those, those out there. So it's a decent recommendation. <laughs> you know what else there is, Max? Too many Taken movies? Yeah, I was going to make a joke about too many <laughs> Liam Neeson obsessed bisexuals. That, that is absolutely <laughs> not true. <laughs> I, I, no, no. As, as the resident bisexual on a spectator film podcast, I can... What people aren't obsessed with is giant Irish nose. I'm not going to insult him like that. I'm just... Filthy Irishman. Listen, we don't need to insult his physical features. Go can... take the potato out of your ass, you f- fucking cracker. Austin, Austin, Austin. We don't need to insult or make stereotypes based on his ethnicity. We can insult him based on his horrible racism and being a general <laughs> piece of shit. That's true. Um, but yeah, so I'm Austin. And I'm Max. And this is the Spectator Film Podcast. And today, we're doing the movie Taken from Taken. 2008. Directed by Pierre Morel. Um, this was my choice. And I, in lieu of the recent storming of the Capitol by a bunch of idiots in the United States of America, I started reflecting on a sort of national conscience that we have in America of like this disgruntled male who's going to take up his guns and take back what's his from these vaguely strange outsiders who have taken it from whom who are ill-defined and generic Brown, not even Brown because taken was one of several movies that I pitched to you. Yes. That fit this thing. Uh, some of the Death Wish movies were also you, on there. We came up with a little, you know, uh, a little stew of revenge <laughs> vigilante Avenger movies. Yes. And I was leaning more toward Death Wish or- originally, actually. Mainly, Why? Uh, because those are campier. And okay. Sure. Once, Although they are, there, there is a lot of violent rape in those. So I probably, yeah. 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 Um, or you were, uh, were you pitching Death Wish 1 or Death Wish 3? Probably 3, honestly. Okay, yeah. Um, but <laughs> we eventually decided on Taken because slightly more recent. Uh, and also, it's a, it's a quintessential post-9-11 film. Yes, um, absolutely. A major event that happened within both of our lifetimes. and I just Perhaps was, you've heard of it. Yeah, well, I, I, I envy the Zoomers. I really do for being able to... They, they will eventually exist in a world where nobody was alive for 9-11 and not have that taint their national consciousness. Yeah, those people can almost drink. Yeah, they can now. No, 20 years. Uh, I, I count people who are one or two at the time of 9-11. Like, That's fair. Yeah. That, that weren't, they weren't conscious for it. And that will never taint them again. And I, I, I envy the Zoomers for that. So keep on making your sea shanties and having a good time, kids. You're going you're gonna to be a good generation. I can feel it. But... I remember watching this movie in the theaters when it came out. And at the time, I just remember thinking, oh, that was a pretty okay action movie. I didn't like action movies at the time. This, okay. This was... Interesting. I was still... What? This came out 2008. So I, I was a teenager. This was when I was starting to really get into horror movies. Um, and I I kind of saw action movies as the jock movies. <laughs> so I didn't As really... the opiate of the masses. You said that, right? You said that originally that that's your quote action movies are the opiate of the masses. Yeah, sure. Um Max. But I really like so I really like horror movies, so but I remember seeing this in theaters with some friends and was like, "Oh, that was pretty okay." And then it left my head. I think I saw it on TV or like with one of my cousins at one point a couple of years later. And then it was just like, oh, Taken. It's that movie where Liam Neeson shoots some people because they take his daughter and whatever. And the, I will find you. I will kill you. I have a very yeah, specific set of skills. That became a bit of a meme. And whatever. I, I moved on. But when I was thinking of movies to do that have to do with, like, this American man who is going to take back what's his. This just popped into mind as sort of a generic option, but I am glad we're doing it because upon rewatching it, Oh boy, there's a lot to unpack here. Yeah. 
this movie is really like blatantly over the top racist islamophobic xenophobic in general um does play like a propaganda movie pretend you're watching this in like a classroom in the 50s about like anybody that the u.s doesn't like it's not even that like this movie like seems to view france as like degraded like a yeah like a crime yeah a crime infested fucking cesspool like anywhere that's not the most affluent areas of the u.s are just filled with sex traffickers who are going to fucking or perhaps max anywhere that doesn't have draconian uh censorship against uh opposition to nationalism or like extreme security measures and anybody who objects to those is either corrupt or naive yeah hopelessly naive and will be abducted by the first frenchman they meet (laughs) those damn french (laughs) yes i knew there was a reason i didn't trust me being attracted to all of them but (sighs) like well one i want to say researching this the after rewatching it and trying to do some research for it it was kind of hard to find (laughs) certain backlash to this movie initially because whenever i would start like googling uh like taken racism or taken yeah. reaction. Liam Neeson punches imaginary black man in his head. Yeah, Liam it was all just about Liam Neeson being a racist <laughs> piece of shit. Um which he is. I, I mean, come up with imaginary black people to fight all the time. And we need to acknowledge that that yeah. Liam Neeson is in fact a racist you piece. You know of weirdly, shit. I feel like he he that never actually happens. He just tried to volunteer that in a weird way to try to seem woke where he's like, "Yeah, I think about punching black people all the time, but I rise above it because I'm awesome yeah it it, it's very weird it's like totally bizarre there's almost no explanation for why you would volunteer that information or why you would feel that way in any situation like it's it's like it is like what a crazed like conservative would consider to be like listen i think about like hurting minorities all the time but i never do it (laughs) like in some ways it's their version of equality like yeah, like, I, it's almost similar to this fucking movie where it's like coming up with a fantasy to justify being racist and shitty to people. That is exactly true. You're, you're 100%. <laughs> Which is, it's very weird. This, this movie is an excuse to yeah. take out violence on anybody vaguely Islamic, foreign, or brown. Yeah. And what a yikes fest. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm glad we chose this one instead of the Death Wish ones because if you if you chose this cycle of movies, which I find interesting, the genre of the vigilante killer movies, um, despite their very reactionary politics, I think it's worth investigating, and I'm glad you chose this. Uh, I'm I'm glad we went with this one specifically because the impulses guiding this movie are so much more specific to uh, America's you know political consciousness and psyche at this moment and over the last 20 years than anything in the 70s. Um, and well, also like Michael Winters is a bit of an easy target as yeah. your, as your yeah. favorite quote from him. I'm uh, to the right of the Nazis. Yeah. He, he's, he was, uh, yeah. An insane person who <laughs> he's just crazy. Um, and have it like being, being somewhat of a Star Trek fan. Like you, you didn't have to fucking do a, uh, Oh, what's her name? Counselor Troy. One of the, one, I don't know. Uh, one of Marina Sirtis. Um, Marina Sirtis had a the whole bit where in uh, Electric Boogaloo, the Canon Films documentary. Oh, this is the thing. He was telling her to like lay down for the lighting tests naked. Yeah, for like for hours. hours. Yeah. yeah. Oh, boy. So, oh, Michael dude. Winner. <laughs> More like loser. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Ooh. But yeah, um, I guess... Uh, you know, to to go off what you're saying and, and my response to this movie, um, you know, I, I started drinking extra early today, so it's going to be hard for me to really articulate why the and vigilante... I started, dr- I started drinking more because I knew we were going to be watching this movie. That's fine. Um, but it's going to be hard for me to articulate why this, this movie and the vigilante genre are kind of like a descendant of uh, the Western gunslinger and why that matters. Um, and nonetheless, we are going to try, we're going to try to talk about that during the commentary track. And, uh, I think it's very valuable to view, you know, how, um, a movie like this really engages its audience and, and how it justifies certain impulses 
in in its like national context because I feel like this movie in many ways, which I saw in the theater and then haven't really seen for the past 12 years, um, you know, it, it really has a very intense connection. Like you said, quintessential 9-11 movie, a very intense connection to its audience and the uh, sort of society it's trying to appeal to. Uh, but specifically, I'll just say that this movie is kind of like a spiritual successor to uh, Old Boy, another movie about revenge and trying to fuck your daughter in the name of revenge uh where this movie is also about kind of sublimating your sexual desire for your daughter into murdering a bunch of brown people there's that <laughs> and, and when you say that we're we're joking they're half joking there's half joking yeah but like what this movie reminds me of and i realized this when we were practicing it uh, if our audience has ever seen those cringy photos online of like this girl and her prom date, like all dressed up, and then the dad with like the gun pointed toward the prom date. Yeah, or the thing where the dad's holding the the guy, yeah, the, like around the shoulders or whatever, or like with yeah. a shirt that's just like a but have her home by eight, or you'll meet my Glock or something like <laughs> like some like I own my daughter and yeah. she's not allowed to do anything sexual until she's married or I regulate my my daughter's sexuality. Yes. It's this movie is an hour and a half of that. Yes. And (laughs) it's one of those movies that like, I almost wish I hadn't revisited it. It's it's weird. It's the interesting thing about this one compared to the rest of the revenge fantasy movies is that it's the most cucked. Like it's so it's everything is charged with like the sexual lack that Liam Neeson is feeling and even though the movie attempt, goes out of its yeah. way to say that he deserves it like yeah his attempt to reassert it and regain it you know he like, was correct to be yeah. overprotective of his daughter he's never wrong he was correct in every aspect that his wife was mad at him about yeah and when his wife has a real problem or his ex-wife rather she goes back to him yeah her billionaire new husband can't do anything for her yeah and I guess the last thing I want to say for like my little you know piece on this in the intro is I think it'd be interesting to do a double feature with this movie in Lost Highway because this movie is such a blatant sort of power fantasy for its audience and uh, so much about justifying and motivating, um, you know, American uh, interference with foreign countries, uh, heightened security measures, um, you know, uh, uh, regulating your daughter's body and strict gender norms, as we've said. Um, It's so much a about those things and uh the fact of it sort of examining those things in the way it does fills it with plot holes because it's just a blatant fantasy and none of it makes sense yeah but I, it, it <laughs> reminds me of like lost highway or mulholland drive you know where those characters have a perfect fantasy of something that then begins to fall apart it's almost like this is a fantasy in a lynch movie that had the you know beginning and end chopped off that tells you it's actually a smart david lynch movie it's just the fantasy part. You did have to during the our pre-screening of this. Like I kept being like, "But why? But wait! But why?" And yes, yeah. like just just stop, just stop. Man. It's not a literal thing. Every decision they make with the plot or the characters in this is somehow tied to like addressing an impulse they expect in the viewer to like feed their reactionary knee-jerk uh, uh, impulse. Like it's all just about like pandering to that to that like mindset. So yeah, not a movie with interesting, you know, very uh very good politics, but I think it's very compelling to look at this movie and the rest of the movies in the Liam Neeson cycle that this has spawned uh as a yeah. sort of view into a certain type of um American media politics and what it reflects about uh the US. But yeah, I don't really have much else to say about it in the introduction. No, let's Let's just go. I'm not going to make a stupid pun about being taken away by this movie. So let's, okay. let's just get going, everyone. All right. We've got plenty of time for those. So. Movie. Yes, we are here. Good old 20th century Fox. That's literally. Well into the 21st century. I, 21st Century Fox would sound weird. You know it. Um, 
I wish we could come up with a better way to start these commentary tracks other than other than just being like. <laughs> I mean, I think it's good to point out the like studio logos and whatnot because it gives our audience time to catch up with us and make sure that they're watching. The you same know, that's a, they are. that's a that's a good thing. Are there any other versions of this movie? I don't think so. <sighs> this this was the era that when they were releasing like the unrated version of every fucking movie. So. But I wouldn't consider those like a real thing. And often I feel like they would release those on DVD. It's just like they would shit it out, and it would just be to like charge you extra for for a DVD or whatever, right? Now I I mean, and it would just be the unrated footage would just mean that it wasn't seen by the uh, uh, by uh, whatever the fuck they're called. <laughs> The conservatives who rate movies, whatever. Um, the idiots at the rating board or whatever. Yeah. If if you're unsure why we hate them so much, one, where have you been? And two, just... What's that documentary called? I was just going to recommend to go watch this film. is not yet rated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that documentary is amazing. And it points out how arbitrary and stupid film rating systems are in the U.S. It's good, It's completely based on nothing. Yeah. There's just no, no consistency whatsoever. And of course, the way that shakes out is it, it aligns with corporate interests. I always love in movies, did you see it, when when clearly they just are shooting on location and they have a crowd of people gathered to watch? Well, yeah, because well, during the holiday season, people love to tweet film facts and whatnot about their favorite Christmas movies. And somehow I didn't know this. I don't. I don't like Elf that much. I don't care if that makes me a bit of a spoil sport. I love you. I love you. I love you. But you don't find that funny. <laughs> but the one thing I did find amusing is the fact that all the scenes of him interacting with people on the street, 90% of those were just real New Yorkers. And they're like, get the fuck away. From <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because you can't get actors to do that better than just <laughs> every New Yorker is James Kahn on the inside. By the way, James Kahn, great Twitter what great Twitter follow. Oh, Everyone right. should Oh, right. Follow. We're watching Taken. I forgot yeah. about that. So we've established he is oversensitive about everything. He's spent 80 bajillion times looking at this one karaoke machine for his daughter. Well, Max, that's just how much he cares and how poor he is. Despite the fact that he lives in a house by himself in Los Angeles, it looks like. Well, to be fair, that probably costs a quarter of a million dollars. Yes, <laughs> a one bedroom house which is plot hole number one uh this military man would be what viewed as blue collar no these are the guys that get jobs at raytheon after they retire from their military career and we know this because his friends are doing that already and he yes. seems to have taken jobs with them before so well they don't have jobs at raytheon but no, they would but, all have jobs at lockheed like, martin or whatever yeah i'm saying they do they do post-military yeah work but this type of person doesn't do like they are special ops people. These are the people that become politicians nowadays, you know, like the Dan Crenshaw's of the world, these dumb fucking idiots. Uh, they, they go around the world shooting people, uh, protecting American corporate interests. And and then they retire to a cushy Austin, job. Austin, stop paying attention. Like the girl in the movie and look at the pony. Yeah. He got oh, her God, a pony. pony. Can um, you tell two white dudes wrote this script? <laughs> that like the dream gift is literally he bought this 18 year old girl up on our pony oh my fucking god she's a horse girl um but no so obviously what's the point in pointing out all these you know plot inconsistencies well uh, you know we don't have to bring up all of them but There's i think it lot. is yeah I, I think it's useful to bring them up from time to time because it reminds you how much of this is just like a pure power fantasy and it's not concerned with reality the thing it's always coming back to instead of reality is trying to, again, justify the impulses, the reactionary impulses in the viewer that it imagines for itself. So, yeah. So what are those impulses so far? If we're ignoring the real-life plot inconsistencies. Uh, Blue-collar worker. Uh, um, um, Liam Neeson buys a blue at a knockoff Radio Shack thing for his daughter who doesn't appreciate him because he, he's cucked. And his wife married uh, a a billionaire George Soros. <laughs> We're going straight there. Okay. I mean, that's the other interesting thing about this movie that ties it to the political consciousness of today in a specific way is how it connects everything to like an underground sex ring and like a hidden cabal of wealthy people that inevitably is certainly not, you know, Jewish people. 
Obviously not. Well, in this movie, it's almost exclusively Muslim people. Yeah. So. Leland or sir. I forgot everyone. I have friends. <laughs> I was supposed to be just sad and alone in my house for all the time. No, Max, these are the other friends that he murdered hundreds of people with. <laughs> Every day is a new adventure. Remember that t- the, they even go through a whole th- like rigmarole where they talk about how in Beirut they just like murdered dozens of people. He's like, where were you when we were murdering people? Caring about your daughter. What's up with that? Lenore now. That's an Edgar Allan Poe reference, Max. Is it? Yeah. I don't think they're smart enough to have made that reference. I just... It 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 speaks to the longing of this character. How alone they are. Well, they're joking that, like, the ex-wife still loves him. Like, which we... Is true, but also, like... Ugh. You know what? Why they split up is she. It, the movie presents it as she was selfish because she couldn't deal with the fact that he might never come home again. See, that's the thing. The movie, the movie has to present her as selfish because Liam Neeson's behavior, his career, and everything is justified. It's not just what he does in this movie is justified. Yeah. It justifies retroactively his entire career that he did that took him away from his family because it's like, oh, the world is a terrible place and we need people like Liam Neeson in the world to murder everyone to keep us safe. So yes, you're right. It It's not him that's responsible for murdering people, maybe being away from his family. Um, it it's It's that the wife can't handle... The reality that, you know, people just need to get murdered by the hundred. And she's naive to yeah. think that they anybody be- should be allowed to travel outside of California. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Everywhere outside of California is just full of... Well, no, California, it's MS-13 gangs, Max. Liberal hellhole, California. Yeah. This is... now. <clears throat> this is somewhere else. <laughs> it's not California. <laughs> I mean, it is California. It is California. Leland Orser, everyone's favorite screaming person from 90s movies. He, for a while, he was typecast as uh, the guy who goes like, oh, oh, God, oh, yeah. <laughs> off of his role in Seven, where he's the guy who um, goes, had, oh, oh, I fucked her. Oh, I fucked her. Oh, God. <laughs> and uh, he does that very well. Um, he... Uh, he, he he's the guy in here seven. we have she-ra from masters of the universe yeah she-ra that's very important we'll get back to that but leland orser max he's the guy who got the knife attached to his dick in seven <laughs> i love how they're just using the actress's headshots as like, <laughs> <laughs> i mean why not i mean this character does she shows up i think again at the very end of the movie yes to be like hey it's the interesting duality that this movie offers that confirms it's truly about, you know, Liam Neeson trying to control his daughter's like sexuality and her life in general. Like, yeah. We don't know if the daughter is just humoring her, him. Yeah. When just like, don't worry, daddy, I still want to be, I'm still your little singer. Yeah. And then moves on immediately. But like, this shows a man that's like amazingly repressed of like his ability to care for other people he's trying to connect with his daughter but it's like a le- it's a fucking david lynch fantasy yeah like he's never progressed past five years old yeah like her as a five-year-old yep. like she still sings she loves her daddy and only he knows what she really wants which is the weird ambiguity about her age too yeah where she it's played by an actor named maggie grace who we talked about this i remember seeing in lost like five years before this, playing someone who was like post college. Yeah, and she's supposed to be seventeen in this movie. It's like no. <laughs> I looks, mean, she, she does l- fine. Yeah. She does fine, but like, no, she's not a bad actress. But like, she looks like three or four years younger than his ex wife. Like, it's it's a bit of a yikes. I I just think it's like it's interesting. There's this weird age ambiguity of his daughter because she needs to, to fulfill the fantasy impulse of this movie. She must both be a little girl and someone who's coming of age sexually at the same time in order for him to like, again, regulate those impulses because it's the regulation of that is going to, the real point is the racism 
but you need you need the like protection of like white white female uh, uh purity in order to justify the racism so that's how we get the regulation of the daughter's body is is really the whole thing is like a this movie is like a make my day punk sort of thing it's just fantasizing about like murdering albanians um what but do albanians do <laughs> come on man <laughs> they're just stand-ins for muslims um they are muslims albania is a but instead of calling them Muslims in this movie, yeah, we can just call them Albanians. Yeah, and, and then it's most not Americans are too stupid to yeah. realize that. Yeah, so. I love this guy. This character is my favorite person <laughs> in the movie. What does he want? Why is he doing this? <laughs> he's not a super fan. He's not a stalker. He's not anything. He's he's man with a knife. <laughs> he's the platonic idea of like a man with a knife. Yeah. Again, David Lynch fantasy. There's no explanation of anything. I like how. Uh, Liam Neeson just pulled out like a soda from his pocket, like he's a video game character with. Oh, an here's, here's my inventory. <laughs> I got ten it's, sodas. It's, it says here, soda removes the shock status ailment. So here he. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh, she's crying in his arms, like, like a like his daughter, surrogate yes. daughter. Again, see, he's a good father figure. That's the thing I didn't finish mentioning. With this sequence, and why it's interesting in setting this up with the uh, she Ra character is it's. It's a duality, right? Because she's performing in a way where she's commodified as a singer. Uh, she's sexualizing herself in a specific way and performing for people's pleasure um, in a way that is kind of comparable to the stage that we see at the end with his daughter on it. Of course, that's much more upsetting circumstances. But the real point in how it plays with like the fantasy impulses in this movie is that it shows that the real thing about this movie is about con- him managing his daughter's sexuality on his terms. Like this whole thing with her being a singer, totally okay to him. The fact that it's part of this weird capitalist machine, much in the same way that the prostitution is no problem. But, and also like she said, it's a lot of hotel rooms and a lot of airports. Like if he's not okay with her traveling to what he thinks is France to go see museums. To see you too. Yeah. To see Bono. We'll get to that when we get there. <laughs> um, but is, is he really going to be okay with her becoming a famous singer and going across the world to do tours? Yeah. I mean, the, when we saw Knife Man, yeah. the best character in the movie, he's probably he Albanian. Past all the security. That's to just hide menacingly with a knife behind a pillar. Albanian men are notorious for being able to get past security at concerts. So that guy with the knife was probably an Albanian, Max. They're everywhere. No, he looks pretty white, honestly. You don't know. Albanians are shapeshifters. And he's still getting her milkshakes like she... (sighs) (laughs) Thanks, Daddy. Like, I know in the context of the movie, this is cute. Like, the movie thinks that this is Liam Neeson being like, I'm the only one who truly knows my daughter, but it comes across exactly like the karaoke machine of like, buddy, she's not five anymore. Totally belittling, yeah. Yeah, but But the thing is, Because the movie is this weird fantasy thing, she still conforms to that, you know? She conforms to Liam Neeson's desires of her in different moments, you know? where, But but you just don't believe it. It's like, this just doesn't feel real. Something is off here. It's, again, it's, that, that's why it feels like a David Lynch dream is because it, it's full of this uncanny valley thing. Only you forget to feel the uncanniness because you realize there's nothing outside of this. This is just the movie. And you're like, oh no, this movie's just dumb. <laughs> In a smarter movie where this is like a dream sequence, this could actually be really compelling. Again, watch this back to back with Lost Highway. They're both movies about loss of sexual potency. Um, of course, one is a lot smarter than the other, and one has Marilyn Manson, and the other does not. Uh, this movie would be greatly... You know what? I would like this movie a lot more if the singer that they were protecting was Marilyn Manson, and Marilyn Manson was crying in Liam Neeson's arms. <laughs> Here's some soda for you, Marilyn Manson. I only want my Manson. <laughs> That's the only thing that will stop me from crying. I, I just got my stimulus check, and I, I stink, <laughs> think I'm going to buy a bottle of don't Marilyn waste, Manson's don't Manson. Don't waste your money on, your ma- on the Manson. It's 66.6% alcohol, Austin. I need to. Oh, my God. That's so clever. No, it's not. Oh, God. Can I also just say Famke Jensen is, like, one of the most beautiful women? You said... Strikingly beautiful. Oh, look, look, she is, but this fucking... 
What? This whole conversation, one, exposition dump to the extreme and awkward. You sacrificed our marriage in service of this country. Do you remember when you did that? This is how normal people talk. And... He drinks, he even does the thing where he drinks with two hands like Donald Trump. At least he doesn't eat pizza with a fork. Does Donald do that? Yes. Oh my God, what a madman. That's fine. If you want to eat pizza with a fork, I don't care. Oh look, she's still crying about it. Her eyes are still red. God, this movie, this movie's surreal, Max. Yeah. Because... I know I'm going to... Because these characters don't exist outside of their interactions with Liam Neeson. Yes, yes, that's why it's a fantasy. Everyone, it's almost like extrapolating the idea of the Manic Pixie Dream Girl, but to literally every character. And I know people are going to be tired of me comparing this to a David Lynch fantasy, but it really is the case. Where, like, every thing he fantasizes aligns perfectly to, like, answer some sort of lack or desire that he would have in the quote-unquote real world, except we never see the real world. (laughs) Just the fantasy. And that's why this is propaganda, because, you know, propaganda is kind of designed to do that. It's designed to give you answers about some sort of antagonist or the world you're living in. And it's designed to reassure you that you're on the right side. And uh, that the people, the other people, the other, are the bad people that you need to continue fighting. So, yeah, this, this movie is so much propaganda, it's insane. But I find it, I find it very compelling to to pick apart the different impulses inside it. You know, I don't think it's a good movie, but I think it's uh, interesting to revisit in that way. Okay. Here's a question for you. Yeah. While we're going through boring airport stuff. Yeah. If we removed all of, I'm, I'm going to go pure, just like dumb brain here. If we removed all of the racism, all of the infantilizing his daughter, all the white supremacy, all the, Weird shit of that. Is this a successful action movie? Is the action in this movie exciting? No. Um, that has a lot to do with the way it's filmed. Yes. Uh, and, and by the way, this movie looks incredibly dated, but you might not notice it at first. It's only in the action scenes where it feels so dated. It, it's just, it plays like a just rip off of like a Paul Greengrass, Christopher Nolan, aughts action movie scene where there's just, like, lots of camera shake, lots of fast editing, um, lots of, like, post-MTV transitions, I'm going to say, with, with, you know, screen graphics and everything. I just think it's an incredibly dated way to make a movie. I wonder if that plane was real. Or they just digitally inserted it. It's like, look, they're at an airport. Sometimes that's easy to do. It's just production value, you know? Interesting enough, though, Max. I, lo- I love how she just left. You think this would have been, like, deep, deep inside of her bag? She just, like, pointed out every single thing about it. We know all her plans now because she basically wrote it out <laughs> for Liam Neeson to find. Oh, God. Again, plot holes. Why can't they just send a bodyguard also, with them or something? A They're, 17-year-old in the year of 2008 is not going to be following you two around Europe. I'm sorry. Well, Max, why do you think they chose you two? It's because Liam Neeson's Irish. They want to make their lead happy. No. You I, choose another Irish I think, people. no. You know what I think it is, like, honestly? What? I think it's because you two is a rock band that this movie's target demographic would be familiar with. <laughs> That's true. I th- I think... Cutting edge in the late 80s. <laughs> they're young, 80 quotes enough that, yeah. like, old, like, the older men who are seeing this movie think that, like, oh, yeah, the kids would like you too, right? They're yeah. still hip enough. No, but- his daughter is about three years away from being in a viral video of her twerking yeah. on someone. Yeah. And that's a good thing. No, like, if it was, okay, she's into rock, and, like, this was, like, Green Day, Fallout Boy, like, I could believe that, but, like, even that, it was about 
It was passing the torch to something else. Yeah, but moving like, on. Two, yeah, the 2008. I'm saying. Yeah, like, it's it's the end of pop punk alt rock emo. Just to have her follow yeah. Rihanna or someone. Yeah, do do a pop star. Yeah. Or like, Rihanna's timeless. Or have her follow Shira, the fictional character that you made up for this movie. No, that would be too, too. That would be sloppy writing, Max. As opposed to you too. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of sloppy writing, the first Frenchman we <laughs> meet, literally the first person we meet as soon as we get off France. the plane. I also love how, in terms of the scenes passing, there's literally no scenes in between when he's like, "This is a terrible idea," and then we get the first very conspicuous sign that it's a terrible idea. <laughs> in the very next moment in the movie. Literally every... You know what? Liam, Season, Liam Neeson is a Mary Sue in this movie. Yeah, he is, 100%. He's good at everything, has no flaws, and is always yep. correct about everything. Not only that, Max, he's a Mary Sue in the sense where it's like, it's reality bending, which is, again, why this feels like such a fantasy. It's because every single part of the movie and the world he lives in conforms to every single thought he has. You know? It's not so much that it's... It's not just how amazing he is and how much of a Neil Breen hero <laughs> Liam Neeson is in this movie. It's that everything in the movie and the world absolutely corresponds to what he thinks of it in every single moment. Never wrong. Every single caution he has is justified. And uh, everything he does to address it is 100% the best thing he could do in that situation. Never mind the fact that he apparently has access to a blank check in the form of his uh, his uh, wife's new lover and uh, could hire an army of Blackwater goons <laughs> to uh, go assassinate all these Albanians with him. Maybe that would go faster. I don't know. Let's just give our information to this guy who asks. And also, you didn't need to know what floor. You could just fucking out front again it just we're just like also this scene just sorry real quick yeah go it shows to it's exercising the daughter of any sin because even though the daughter lied to him about the concert thing one she admits that later on the phone and two she didn't know that the cousins weren't going to be here so so it absolves her is what you're yes. saying yeah at least partially and she's not a whore like Amanda, yes. who wants to sleep with this Amanda, French guy. Amanda deserves to be punished, and that's seen later. But yeah. Spoilers, Amanda fucking dies, and the movie doesn't care at all. <laughs> Not only the movie, <laughs> Liam Neeson doesn't care. Nobody shit cares. At all. Liam Neeson, even before he knows she's dead, is like negotiating with them over the phone or whatever, and she's, he's like, I don't, you can take the blonde. I don't care. <laughs> you could take the other girl. In any movie like now, you would, like, the very minimum you have to have a scene toward the end of the movie where like you go to Amanda's parents and you're like, I'm sorry. I tried. I'm sorry my that you raised a whore. <laughs> you know what I mean though? But, like, yes. you, you have the scene of like, I did my best to save your daughter. I'm very sorry. Unfortunately, then, she was the whore of Babylon and got herself yeah. killed. I, I, I know you did Liam Neeson. I know you're perfect and you would have <laughs> saved her if you could. Like you would have that scene. You, you know pressed what I mean? F to pay your respects. <laughs> and our daughter's dead corpse mangled in, in, in the prostitution flop house. And l listen, as somebody who lives with anxiety, I get this, but also like he's one, breaking. You have to like this man lives in a house without any lights <laughs> <laughs> and just sits in the dark, sits in the dark all day, being anxious about shit. Everything's very dramatic. Oh, I'm sorry. There's one light bulb back there. Yeah. <laughs> to be uh, fair, to be fair, though. I live with two straight men, and if it was up to them, our apartment would be decorated by nothing but a single light bulb hanging by a wire, a chair, and a PlayStation 4. So, yeah, I, I can see that. There's That's just a difference in lifestyle. I'm tired of all these people haranguing straight men for not spending money on, like, fucking Christmas lights. It's not Christmas lights. It's <laughs> decorating to make your apartment feel lived in. And you're not as bad as my roommates are. You're you're not the best, but you're not nearly as bad as my roommate. See, are. my problem is I have too much shit, and I have to buy more furniture to put to, the shit on. And the real problem is the pandemic, where it's like, 
I want to buy more furniture, right? Now. I yeah. should really get into making furniture is the thing. If I could make some really good shelves or whatever. I love how we're talking about this during the most dramatic iconic scene yeah, of the movie. True. This is the this is the most important scene in the movie because this is what actually made it a financial success. Oh yeah, this movie yeah. we didn't talk about this at all during the intro, but this movie not generally critically well received. Um it, at, at the very least it was mixed. It was like for eh, sure. yeah. yeah, it was like an eh shoulder movie. shrug. But Hugely financially successful. Like, I think more than doubled its budget. At the As box evidenced office. by the many yeah. sequels. And the many other movies in the Liam Neeson, I'm a Revenge Man cycle. Or just Liam that Neeson. That continues movie. to this day. We just saw a new movie that he was in that would not exist without this movie called, like, The Honest One. <laughs> the Honest Wolf Puncher. Yeah. Uh, that's we were talking about the gray during our pre-screening and I was talking about how like that movie pissed off a lot of people because like the movie promised like an hour and a half of Liam Neeson fighting wolves and it's not that at all. Yeah. But it's him saying a poem over and over again in his head and then eventually he's going to punch a wolf and he loses. That movie's yeah, that's the thing though. Like the movie's it's dumb bo- but I like it. It's bold like yeah. Good for you for promising to <laughs> have a William and Eason wolf punching movie and then not deliver on it. Yeah. You know what? The movie's just about like bros dying. I don't know. I kind of like that. I got to be honest. I do like movies that oh, are yeah, just no, about that, like dudes. I undershot it by a lot. I was trying to be conservative, but I, when I <laughs> said this movie more than doubled its money, this movie was made on a budget of $25 million. Okay. Uh, made two hundred and twenty six million dollars. It's pretty. Uh, so nearly ten yeah. times its budget. It's quite good for an action movie too. Yeah, to do that. Um, of course, the thing about these revenge movies is that they're all a one trick pony. Um, that's why you get if Death Wish had come out nowadays, you get so many memes about like everyone in Charles Bronson's family getting like raped and murdered to death. <laughs> Well, that's the point. And three, he's out of friends and family. So like, they have to invent new friends for yeah. him to, to get raped and murdered. They like they would get to the point where like he like there's so many movies in that he has a relationship with like the first people that raped and murdered his family, and then they get raped and murdered, and he has to go get revenge on them. Or like you know, he couldn't get revenge on the first people, so he has to get revenge on the people that killed the first people. Oh my God, Max, this is the the moment that sold the movie. And we were trying to discuss this and really like pick apart why why was this so effective in the marketing, this phone call where he just threatens this guy? It's this what are our ideas that were thrown at the board? Okay. Uh, besides being a racist piece of shit, uh, Liam Neeson is an effective actor. Um, and I would say this is probably his best moment in the movie. He is putting genuine emotion into this. There's like a genuine like reserved anger, sadness, yeah, I mean, he's a good actor. Through. He's yeah. well-delivered, yeah. And with the lighting and the general badassery, I can see how this plays to a wide audience. Like, this this is badass. Like, I'm, you took my daughter, which everybody can agree is a bad thing, and, like... Don't do that. I, I, I will fuck you up for touching my family. Yeah. Like, it, it's a universal impulse. I get that, and it's... It's a well done thing. I don't think it's groundbreaking, but like, I just think there's something interesting, like, because without that, this movie is so generic and unremarkable, you know, but the fact the whole like linchpin of this movie and the marketing and why it was financially successful is the fact that he gets to articulate the fact that he's going to fuck these people up before he does it. Like, he's like, I, I'm warning you. I am justified to be incredibly racist. And violent in my treatment towards you. And I'm going to do that. So goodbye. So I like. So let I, me break into our room to find. What? No, he's not breaking in now, Max. They just let him in because they know that he's in charge. And they trust him now that these weak, weak wristed liberals um, know that a non soy man is in the house. He's the alpha now. What is he looking for? I forget what he finds in here that's important. Anything. The only reason this exists is, again, this scene exists not only to get exposition about the stakes, 
but also it's a it's a scene for him to check in with the people that were cucking him beforehand to see to say like see i am more important than you are and i even the russians are afraid of these people that's how bad they are yeah they've uh, they've usurped america's former supervillain even, even vladimir putin doesn't mess with these guys no but like the albanians I, we mention the russians a lot in this movie just in passing but like they they're they're never there and i think that's like Yet again, I think that is post 9-11 cinema of just like, no, these these scary Muslims <laughs> have replaced the Russians yeah. as... Well, it's because like the Cold War, the war on terror is all about summoning some specter of an enemy that you don't directly see, you know? And and it's fought in the in the minds of 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 like your own country where it's like, okay, we have to convince everyone that these people are like Huns and heathens in order to justify like bombing the shit out of them so we can get their oil or whatever. But really, I, I, I do think it's interesting how this scene mostly exists for the exposition. Um, and the exposition, you know, kind of distracts you from the fact that it's the only reason this scene is exists and is in the movie is for him to get one over on on the weak people who cucked him <laughs> that he tolerated um, and abided. But now that shit is on the line, he's, he's cutting right through them like butter. He's laser focused. He's going to keep listening to this over and over again for his yeah. entire trip to Paris. And of course the, we can go into the other plot holes. Like, you know, she married a rich billionaire, obviously by his mansion and uh, just his general exuberance. Uh, that billionaire would be shitting his pants because he'd be like, oh, wait, I've purchased girls from this prostitution ring before. Oh, my God. Yeah, you think that that would make it easier. He's like, guys, you fucked up. That's my... This is mine. Yeah, you, you got to let her go. And be like, no, oh. no, no I, I didn't buy this one before. No, this one's like my stepdaughter. Yeah, can you, you're you going to have to find a different one. They're like, oh, of course, you're our best customer. <laughs> and maybe... You know, for my trouble, maybe you can give me a few on the house. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, like, Fam- Famke Jensen's wife, or uh, husband, would be, you know, suspect number one here. He would know all this shit. Furthermore, and also, yeah, he could hire 80 kill squad. <laughs> Dropping his name would be far more effective at dissuading these Albanians from doing anything than anything Liam Neeson could ever do. Yeah, he drops, yep. he drops the name of his minor French official friend. That's how he gets places in this. But you're yeah. like, oh, no, I'm the kill squad. You drop the name of a billionaire. Can of you the- imagine like fucking with like a billionaire that has like fuck you money and could just like blow your shit up? Yeah. Elon Musk could assassinate anybody in this. <laughs> yeah. if he felt like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank God Elon Musk is just like a, a limp dick, like epic Redditor guy. Yeah. <laughs> Too bad he's getting into fights with people calling him a cuck on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. I mean, good for us. <laughs> Apparently, it's very easy to break into this apartment, by the way. And this apparently, bi- the French police don't investigate crime. They don't exist. That's why we need strong police laws, Max. Because otherwise, women will be abducted out of whole floor apartments on the fifth floor. By the way, did we mention that this apartment is the entire fifth floor of this building, and yet there's no security in this building whatsoever? Perhaps this building in France is different than most buildings in the U.S., but... There would have to be a lobby and, like... yeah. You know, I don't I don't think that this rich person building with an entire floor apartment would not have any security. But whatever. We're missing the point of the movie when we bring that shit up because the movie isn't interested in that. It's a fantasy. You know, the best way this movie could happen if Lee because like his daughter barely fit under this bed. If Liam Neeson crawled in the bed and then got stuck and wasted a good portion of the ninety six hours he has <laughs> to find his daughter trying to get out of the bed. I only have twenty hours left. <laughs> What did you do? I don't want to talk about it. I was I was being a detective. We we should take a shot every time man speaking Albanian is used in the subtitles. Uh, I'd be really I'd be dead by that point. It's too late to do that. By the way, another interesting thing to bring up just reinforcing how much this movie is reliant on the uh, mechanism of imagination and fantasy in order to motivate its plot and action. Uh, It's using detective scene 
you know, uh, approach here in, in its storytelling where it's like Liam Neeson has to put together the clues and everything. And the interesting thing about detective fiction and mystery fiction in that way is that often it works as a, as a state of extended like imagination or fantasy. And by that, I mean like detectives interact with clues and items in the real world and then construct a fantasy to motivate the, the explanation of the scene of the crime. Right. So like a good detective is someone who can come up with a fantasy that overlaps with reality. Right. Cause they deduce the fantasy from what, from what they're observing on the scene of the crime, but they don't know it's actually real until they confirm it. Does that make sense? Yeah. But it's interesting because so much of this movie is Liam Neeson doing detective work, even though I wouldn't call this a detective movie. Zoom and enhance. <laughs> yeah. We literally have an enhance button on this circa 2008 cell phone picture printer terminal yeah god luckily he's wearing his same jacket okay so that guy is is his handler or whatever yeah the guy who randomly fights Liam Neeson later but he doesn't come back it doesn't matter yeah. You know what's fascinating is how many people would notice if these people did this all the time. Of course, it doesn't matter because this French society is rotten to the core. They don't care. They, they know it. All know it happens. I think it's funny how Liam Neeson punches this guy in the liver and he treats it like a critical hit every time. <laughs> I do like... Because that's an action movie trope of just like, well, no, stop it. Just drive. And then they'll just do it. I do like how the cab driver just gets out and gets the police. <laughs> that's the, mo like, the most reasonable thing I've seen happen in this movie so far. I want the cab driver to be Travis Bickle and just completely insane. And then they go on a vengeance quest together. Travis Bickle, another character who uh, obviously becomes a kind of like right wing Avenger towards the end of uh, Taxi Driver. Oh, taxi driver. What was I saying? Is is taxi driver right wing in its politics, you think? No, I don't think so. I think taxi driver is trying to take a sympathetic view of of a reactionary person who is crazy. Yeah. But that's that I think that's, you know, that's yeah. that's Martin Scorsese at his core. He's a very sympathetic filmmaker where he makes movies about terrible people. And people often make the mistake of thinking that his movies endorse those characters, but really he's just no. He tries to treat them all with sympathy. He's showing the hu like he's yeah. showing that they're humans. For all, uh, nice final destination style death there. Um, that would never happen in a Martin Scorsese movie because his characters. Uh, oh God, he cares about them too much. The fucking, Except for the part when the Martin Sheen explodes edits. into a blood puddle. The edits are so terrible. I hate it so much. And we haven't even mentioned the fact that Taken 3 has become a bit of a joke in the film community. But like, I wish there was more of that because it would be funny. Yeah. The funniest thing we've seen him do so far is just that, where he did the old, I'm reading a newspaper gag. <laughs> I kind of enjoy that. I always love it in movies when they do shit like that, where it's just like the classic, new, I'm reading a newspaper, but I'm actually following you. It's great stuff. If you're a filmmaker I don't, and you're listening to this for some reason, I don't care what your movie's about that you're working on right now. you got to put in a scene where somebody is pretending to read a newspaper and then they follow someone. Because without that, is it really a movie? I don't know. Oh, good. So right now he's accosting his French friend who, of course, is going to be revealed to, to be uh, on the take with these Albanians in on the whole thing. And I think this is an interesting uh, sort of point of convergence with the older vigilante movies. Um, because those movies take for granted that the powers that be, the authorities, are absolutely corrupt and useless. Of course, his name is Jean-Claude. Why would that be? Of it's, course. Jean-Claude. It's just like the level the script is operating on is that's they just thought of the most 
French name they could, and that that's his French friend's name. I don't know. I, I yet again, I can't talk. I've I've met people who are stereotypical French named, but come on. I don't know. I love how they like dispensed with the <laughs> secret meetup almost immediately. Yeah. Like it was supposed to be like, oh, okay, we're going to meet up here. I'm going to pretend to do it. And then they're just chatting. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Of course, his French friend won't help him. Cause like I was saying, the, the authorities are corrupt and ineffectual because they're French. Or, not they're, just they're anti patriot Yeah. Not just French though. I think it also reflects on, we see no example of U S authority in this movie, but I think if you compare this movie to stuff like death wish and, and the way that views like U S authority, all of that is corrupt and ineffectual as well. Right. The whole thing in this movie is that it's kind of like a fallen world and people like Liam Neeson are the last bastion of like a true, true, uh, uh, like manhood that's required to actually bring uh, reason and righteousness to the world. This is funny. He picks up the translator in the area where uh, sex workers are standing outside trying to get people. I, I like to think that that translator always just hangs out there <laughs> the translator told him to go there and he's like this is convenient uh, offering it like he, he just offers his service there. and the pimps get mad he's always there but he's like listen i was here first <laughs> he's like i hate this guy he's always taking away our money yeah. getting customers teaching them albanian <laughs> instead of having them have sex with our girls <laughs> and then they can speak our language and they realize we're ripping them off <laughs> yeah it's the worst. I hate this guy. <laughs> the way Liam Neeson talks to this girl is just so bizarre and weird. Well, I think that's supposed to be the point. He's I know. It's just it it hits the nail on the head like so well that it makes me laugh. It's like I it's just like what? What <laughs> this is just like so weird. Oh my god. I'm so glad I'm not a woman. <laughs> can you imagine having no to deal No comment. Can you imagine having to deal with people like this? Like on a regular basis. Holy shit. So yeah, the, oh, the, the, the point I wanted to elaborate on in uh, comparing this to the earlier vigilante movies and the relationship to the authorities and the police is how uh, the police are not merely viewed as like ineffectual or corrupt in this. I, I think it's interesting how like the authorities are seen as being like, it, it's now turned to a, a place where like the authorities are kind of like puppets of this grand international cabal. The scale of this movie is much greater than like Death Wish. You know, Death Wish is kind of a lot smaller because it's about like a personal revenge. But if you really think about this movie, Liam Neeson takes down and like he doesn't take down the whole sex ring, but he, like he takes down like a Jeffrey Epstein level cabal, you know? And not just because he has a moral thing against it. Yeah, it's he, for his daughter. He, he sees so many other women. And he saves one of them because he has she has the daughter's jacket. He's not a hero. He doesn't save any of these other women. And oh god. Well, we don't know how far up it goes. We know his friends involved with it and let lets it happen, but like Yikes. <laughs> But I, I just think it's interesting how this movie has upped the ante from those previous vigilante movies, you know? Yeah, like the Death Wish movies. And I was thinking, and Taken is probably a good example, because I, although the enemy in Taken is ill and like ill-defined, it's more well-defined than it is in Death Wish. Death Wish, 
it is ruffians. <laughs> it is gangsters. Um, yeah. And the I, I love the 70s, 80s definition of gangsters because old people back then didn't understand gangsters and punks and everything. Were <laughs> What's the difference between a gangster and a punk? They were different. So, like, it's all just... A, a multi a melting pot of different ethnicities and styles of those hip hop listening punks. Yeah, that's how the gangs in eighties movies all look like post apocalyptic warriors. Yeah, because <laughs> all these old people making these movies or whatever with reactionary politics had no idea what they were thinking or <laughs> or, or like really talking about. I kind of love that. No, it's and it's hilarious in hindsight. Yeah, but it's like how warrior the warriors becomes like so campy in a certain sense because but the warriors is the warriors i know they knew to a certain degree what they were doing with yeah. the warriors you don't I, make a movie yeah. with a mime gang I'm, I'm just saying like like i don't think people literally thought there were mime gangs running around or, or people dressed up with baseball face paint there but should like, be i mean that's beside the point and that goes without saying of course there should be in fact we're gonna start one listeners you have an obligation to join us um join join our <laughs> uh, the ten dollar a month thing on our Patreon to, <laughs> to be part of our gang, to be part of the mime gang. <laughs> Hashtag mime gang, where there's no content and we don't say anything to each other. Yep, best kind of podcast. <laughs> In fact, you have to mime the content on your own. For ten dollars a month, we will finally shut up. <laughs> yeah, for ten dollars a month, you have to mime that you're listening to us talk about something else. But uh, no, I, like. I do think that's very um, interesting, and and you're right. Where like as vague as this movie is, it is kind of more specific, and he does have a more specific mission, kind of, than just I don't know vague death wish stuff. But can, no, I, I'm sorry, I I brought that up because that's the reason why like I I was focused on this kind of movie because the the storming of the capital it's the the zenith of a, a lot of people's vague anger toward this imagined other and they don't they don't they're not really sure who they want to be mad at and if you like yeah. talk to like a random QAnon supporter it's like who's in on it it's whoever they feel they need to be angry at and it's like the Jews the Muslims the Democrats any Republican who's not fully on support with their cause. Literally just, almost every Republican except for Donald Trump. Yes. Yeah. The rich except the rich that kind of support them. Um, like, yeah, it's just a vague cabal of the others, the evils. Yeah, it's vague because there's literally no consistency whatsoever. Yeah. But also it's highly specific because everyone on it is like, why? Like, why... Like, why is fucking, uh, uh, you know, a Kristen Wiig on your list of people who are executed and replaced with cyborgs? I don't understand. Like, why? And we can get into the crazier QAnon stuff, but, like, that's that's kind of missing the point. And it's like, I think I saw a continuity between, and people have already pointed out that there is, there is definitely a through line between the Tea Party movement and modern-day QAnon of just radicalized right-wing people doing like crazy conspiracy theories and protesting too much and just being annoying mainly. But I think it like, you can see the vein in the nine 11, like post nine 11 consciousness of America here where like you're being told to hate these people and you're like, you know that somebody did something wrong to you, but you're not sure what these other people have necessarily to do with it, but everybody else is getting angry at them. Yeah. So you should be as well. And and we're gonna construct we're gonna construct a fantasy to justify yeah our violence and uh, and explain why the bad things happened. That really struck me watching yeah. this another time of how just blatant that is. No, you, I mean you're absolutely right. The mechanism is the same, right, Max? And it's obviously more noticeable in QAnon because compared to this movie, if we're comparing them as fantasies, the QAnon fantasy is insane. It's it's truly the wackiest sci-fi story ever. It's like the the beginning of like Scientology, <laughs> their Genesis story, right? Um, but it, you know, it's it's serving the same function where it's all about like explaining the bad thing that happened to me in a way that absolves me of guilt 
yes. and make puts me in the right and also uh, allows me to it, it, it sort of justifies my like violent reprisals on people who supposedly are responsible for whatever the bad thing is. And uh, this is a different version of that, you know, and I, I think I think the QAnon stuff could obviously is like I think it was an inevitable thing that was going to happen with the U.S. In, and the Internet as it became a more important part of our society and culture and the expansion of 24 hour media, you know, where it's like at a certain point we will get so removed from reality. Uh, the, the procession of simulacra will be so profound in the U S that, you know, people will be completely detached from the world they're living in and construct a fantasy to explain all their material shortcomings that even though it, you know, at certain points has some sort of semblance that might make it closer to reality is utterly detached from any material explanation whatsoever. And that's what this movie is too. That's why it's full of so many plot holes. And I do think it might be interesting to look at the whole Liam Neeson revenge man cycle of action movies. Um, I we watched. Might, we might have to space that out a little bit because honestly. Oh, not in the show. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if anyone listening to this wanted to do a thesis on that and and reactionary right wing politics, that could be a fruitful uh, sort of you know basket of research for you guys. But I watched another one of those movies for the show this week um non-stop i watched that came oh, out in yeah. 2014 in my mind that's kind of like the apotheosis of this cycle of liam neeson action man movies because it's very similar to taken in, in its sort of themes and uh the I- ideas guiding it but it's more self-consciously a post 9-11 movie where it's trying to explore the trauma of, of 9-11 again you know it sets up this terrorist situation on board a plane and uh, spoilers for this dumb movie. Uh, the bad guy is a Iraqi war veteran. Um, and it's about how, like, you know, he's motivated by the fact, like, the, the Iraq war was, like, confusing and didn't mean anything or whatever. And uh, it's it's sort of more self-consciously trying to play on all of this. Um, and I think it's interesting to look at the progression of, you know, from Taken to that movie about five or six years later where that movie Liam Neeson's revenge man character is a lot less, um, you know, polished and perfect than his character in this. Um, where at that point he's not trying to do some sort of grand thing, like save his daughter and bring down an international prostitution ring. He's just trying to keep a plane from blowing up. (laughs) Yeah. And people are calling him the terrorist. He's like, I'm not the terrorist. Someone is trying to blow up. Well, this people plane. are calling him a terrorist in this movie too, basically. Liam sure, Neeson, but you can't tear apart Paris to save your daughter. But I have to tear apart. But Paris. there's never a question of the validity of their claims. They're always he's always justified in yes. this movie. Whereas in Nonstop, there's more of a question. Yeah, you know, it's not very compelling in the way it poses this question. But I suppose you could play with the idea, like you know, is he actually losing his mind? Is he going crazy? You know, whatever. You know, because it's a thriller movie, he's not actually going crazy. But it's like. He, there's more of a an effort put into setting up that intrigue, whereas in this he's just one hundred percent right. But it's interesting because it's like you see this progression where the revenge man character from this movie to that one is made like smaller and smaller, until it's like, all right, yeah, I'm a total fuck up in everything in my life, and everything sucks. But I'm not trying to bomb this plane. I'm not a terrorist. <laughs> Whereas in this one, he's basically Superman. Apparently, he's helped the French government numerous times before. So enough, like that's the thing because they're ungrateful bastards. They are. That's why we had freedom fries. But that's that's the thing. Like this movie just invents connections he has whenever the script fucking needs it. And I know that's another Mary Sue thing, but yeah. Like, where does he find a room? He knows this guy in France <laughs> who gives him a hotel room and knows him well enough to be it like, has oh, a the spare usual. IV yeah. ready for him. Oh, I figured he pulled that out of his video game inventory. <laughs> um, the fact yes. that he has anti 
drug addiction IVs. Also, can someone tell me, like, listener, would it actually work if you had a walkie-talkie held up next to a cell phone? I mean, I feel like I feel like that would not. You would get the feed. I imagine you get the feedback thing. I don't know to to a degree, but it also like I don't know how walkie talkies work versus cell phones, but I don't think it would work just like talking (laughs) over a cell phone. I mean, what if like your hand accidentally slipped off the thing and it was like, and he's like, oh, he he has a walkie talkie. Fuck. (laughs) No, that would never happen, Max, because he's perfect. Perhaps it's even possible that he invented that device and he made it off screen. And it's the only walkie talkie in the world that can work in that way. And the sound quality is unmatched by anything. Even when I saw this movie when I was like 10 in the theater, I was like kind of shocked by how little care Liam Neeson had for the other women in this movie. And like, this was like one of those examples with this girl where it's like, oh, this girl didn't do anything wrong. She's just an entire, she's pure victim in this situation. Yeah. Uh, Liam Neeson extracts information from her and then we never see her again. It's like, well, is she, is she okay? Or I guess she's going to go home now. Did you at least leave her with a therapist so she didn't like kill herself the moment you <laughs> left Liam Neeson? No, I don't know. If this movie was good, she would have become his sidekick. Yeah. I would much rather see a movie about women breaking free from the prostitution ring and then bringing it down. This movie was written by uh, Luke Passon. Well, well, he was one of the you writers. Do, do a Mad Max Fury Road type situation. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Bring in the writer of the vagina monologues and have her consult you on You don't even need that as reference point. You don't even need it to be smart, Max. Luc Besson has made plenty of movies about women just shooting things up. You know, Fifth Element, obviously, but uh, also La Femme Nikita, right? Just Luc Besson loves it when girls shoot things. (laughs) This movie would have been a lot more fun of just having a girl shoot them. But th- you know what? Then again, now that I say that, you get a lot of those movies where it's like the the superficial, you know, girl power movie where they just shoot a bunch of people and it just winds up being stupid. And also... Those movies are irritating, you yeah, know? Yeah, but... And also, like, that, this kind of movie doing that usually is to exonerate its racism. <laughs> Almost like, we can't be problematic. Look, we That's have true. a girl. That's true. That would make... That's the even more effective liberal move. That's a liberal who voted for the Iraq war. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we want to kill brown people, but girls can do it too. More women guards. (laughs) More disabled drone pilots of color. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. To kill Marco from Tripoya. Now, Max, you brought up the freedom fries. Yes. I wonder, after you said that, if that is actually the reason why this takes place in France. Because, again, this movie is obviously about exoneration of, you know, uh, U.S. Middle Eastern interference in the Iraq war after 9-11. And it's obviously about justifying all those terrible impulses to murder foreigners. And, you know, Middle Eastern people specifically, or people that seem... Okay, so giving, giving this movie the slightest benefit of the doubt, and it's okay. not operating on that stupid of a level... Go ahead. Do, uh, do it as a devil's advocate sort of thing. That the French didn't support us in the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan, so that's why we're setting it in this hellscape of Paris. Assuming that... Wouldn't it be better to have, like... She's going on tour across Europe wouldn't like you have her like have somebody hijack the plane or like have somebody when she's stopping by like when she's in Berlin somebody invites her to a rave and then they take her into 
the Ukraine or something like that. And then they talk, take her to Dr. Laser Dieter. Yeah. <laughs> to sew her face to someone's ass. But you know what I mean. But like, sure. That's the kind of thing that you would normally do. But like, why Paris? I like, my guess would be to show that like, oh, even in the, the cultural civilized thing, it's it, this disease has already infected them. You you can't assume just because it's, it's a, like a subversion. You can't assume just because they're white. Yeah, just because France is a white European country that they don't have like Albanians running around, and that you know just because they're tall, they they tolerate the Albanian prostitution rings. Yeah, that's what that's where tolerance really gets you. Yes, is prostitution rings. immediately give them an inch and drug then fueled you- opium addicted. <laughs> Women kidnapping prostitution rings. Give them an inch, and they take a prostitution ring. <laughs> oh my god, he caught the guy. Who I love said how we look. needed five cuts to remind us that it's the same guy. Because we're stupid. This movie says, you're stupid. Look at this. Max, that scene would have had so much more organic tension if they just, in a vaguely Ozu-like way, uh, just had a very straightforward, um, you know, shot-reverse shot of head-on camera, like straightforward camera address between him and that guy who said good luck, and he's like, we talked on the phone two days ago. You know what? I would love an action movie like this, and I'm sure you're going to tell me it already exists, but like... I hope it does. In one of these scenes where like the guy starts doing a badass thing, and like tries to kick all the guns out of people's hands before they can do the action hero just gets shot and dies. And then like we pick up with a different character. Hmm. I'm sure there is. I can't think of one now. Have I ever talked about how much I just fucking love thrillers? Yes. A, a good, a good to me, maybe not on the show as much. Yeah, a good thriller is just like, fuck. Yeah. I just love a good thriller because good thrillers ride the line between horror and drama in a very specific way. Not that horror movies don't incorporate drama or anything. It's just... Oh, fuck you. You're not my daughter. <laughs> one of the many times he does that. Oh, my God. He found Amanda. Oh, remember her, everyone? Yes, yeah, she's fucking dead. That's what you get for saying that you're attracted to somebody. And also, we know for a fact that she's not a virgin because she's here and not, you know, dressed up in her like and she Las ch- Vegas. <laughs> she chastised Liam Neeson's daughter earlier for come for, on for being a virgin. You're 17 and you haven't lost your virginity yet. Come on. You yeah. should be sleeping with random French dudes that we met at the airport. You should be sleeping with literally the first person we met in France. Oh, by the way, speaking of exonerating <laughs> U.S. activities in the Iraq War, the we've war moved on to the torture portion of the movie, everyone. It's he- justified. <laughs> it's like in 24, where he tortures somebody at least once every episode, which means he's tortured 24 people in a day. Max, I'm so glad you brought that up, because this movie shares a lot in common with 24. This movie... For our younger listeners, who might be too young to remember this, actually, because 24 like was probably like right on the... Ten end. years ago now. Yeah, it's at least 24 was an immensely popular television immensely, show. Immensely, yeah. In the wake of 9/11, it I never was super into it, but it basically followed the adventures of hero action man as he tortured his way to save America from evil terrorists who were just trying to destroy it. Solid Snake went around punching terrorists. Don't insult Snake that way. But he, isn't he the isn't Kiefer Sutherland the voice of is well what snake is he? He's one of the snakes, but still there's um, a lot of snakes. But anyway, um, twenty four. It's called that because each episode was like an hour long. Yeah, or like took place in the span of an hour of the day. And oh, uh, you explaining this makes me feel so old. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> and also, oh boy, was there a lot of torture in twenty four? It it was just like a feature of the show because this was when. It came out that we had been waterboarding a whole shit ton of people. And it was trying to... A lot At of the very ju- least, yeah, waterboarding, a, yeah. A lot of just... Well, I don't feel like talking about Abu Ghraib, man. I don't yeah. need to be depressed for the rest of the week. But 
we'd been doing a lot of shit to people and there was a lot of urges in US media not necessarily to excuse torture but just sort of sort of show it and then it happened to work and yes it was always shown horrifically and it was look how terrible this is but like in the end it got the information out of them so is it really that bad and god yikes you can see so much of it in media from this time and like yeah this is 2008 this is when obama was promising that we would shut this down so like this is even like a little late for that trend but i i remember that that being one of his big like campaign things is shutting down guantanamo bay yes and how much like my conservative family would talk about shutting down guantanamo bay and how dangerous that would be for everyone of course, I was like 10 and didn't... Oh, read. I have a baguette for my family. <laughs> it is just great that they throw in that, that he comes home with a baguette. But yeah, no, no I, I do think the torture stuff is very interesting to this because that proves beyond the shadow of a doubt that I think, again, this movie is addressing the Iraq war. You know, you can't argue against it. It's, it's a blatant fantasy exonerating those things. And you're right in saying that the the attitude of the Iraq war has shifted immensely uh just online in the last like 10 to 15 years thank god yeah where well not enough in my opinion um where people there's there's still plenty of people willing to now that we have trump look at bush as some sort of like saintly (laughs) grandpa but the dancing on ellen george w bush yeah like yeah fuck all you people um george bush is worse than donald trump i'm sorry uh, I maybe that's a conversation for another time, but he he definitely was worse president. Oh well, he that's because he managed to get shit like his crazy agenda actually done for the yeah. most part, and not just inflate his own ego. He, at least Trump was incompetent. Thank yeah. God. Yeah. <laughs> at um, least Donald Trump was incompetent. Yeah. You uh, know what it was? Trump was too egotistical to have a Dick Cheney running the show. Behind that's it. true. That's true. Because Dick Cheney was really, he, he pulled more of the strings, I feel. You want to know a surprising fact about Dick Cheney? Are you going to tell me about his five hearts, he said? No. He's still alive. Well, yeah. Against all logic and reason and laws of the universe, that man is still fucking alive. I hope our listeners... Karma is not real. Yeah, I hope our listeners are the type of people that are fuming about, you know, Dick Cheney still being alive already. <laughs> um, but if you're not, you might need to find a different film podcast. Not, not only is he still alive, he's alive on his like third heart transplant or yeah. whatever. And the give cur- those hearts to somebody else. You know what the little kernel of this is that's amazing? Is that the heart he has currently, I think is from someone who died in the Iraq war. God doesn't exist. <laughs> God isn't real. I hope Dick Cheney is assassinated in a video game. Maybe, <laughs> maybe in Call of Duty Iraq war. Dick Cheney will be able to call me by my they them pronouns <laughs> after before ordering me to commit more war crimes and then shoot you in the face and force you oh, to Liam, apologize for it. Liam Neeson just shot a completely innocent woman. <laughs> yes, it completely was innocent. I guess this is another scene of torture, right? I just shot a woman and it's justified. It's not justified. This guy is complicit. His wife is an old friend of his. His wife was ecstatic to see him after all of these years. Just tell his wife. You think his wife isn't... His wife would be, like, on your side. Yeah. She'd be like, what the fuck? You're helping to run a prostitution ring? Yeah. What if that happened to one of our daughters? Yeah, he has two daughters, right? He has a, at least a son. Yeah, he has a son and a daughter. But yeah, it's interesting how this movie was co-written by Luc Besson, and yet it seems to hate the French and treat them as you know soys, soys who have been Im- infiltrated. And here we have the generic uh, Jeffrey Epstein party he has to break into. People always talk about like these big Jeffrey Epstein parties, but like. <laughs> Listen, oh my god, was that Ghislaine Maxwell? I don't think that, like... Because I, I do think there is a gigantic pedophilia problem like this, and I do think that there are child fuckers among, like, the ultra-wealthy. But I don't think they all have, like, gigantic eyes-wide-shut parties where they're just like, here, <laughs> let's all bid for this child now. 
You like, know what? Before, that's like comic book villain level. Before of- Jeffrey Epstein was murdered, I might have agreed with you, but now I don't know. Because you know, part of it is being so blatant about it, about it and getting away with it, Max. The thing is, you don't know, and they love that. Yeah, no, the Jeffrey Epstein murder was just like, wow, you can you can guy just get away from. That was the whole point. Yeah, because he was clearly murdered, and the whole thing was that. Yeah, you know he was murdered, and we know he was murdered, and we know you know he was murdered. But we're going to say he committed suicide, and we're going to get away with it just because, just to show you that we can get away with it. So just give up. Imagine if, like, one-tenth of the effort the QAnon people put into that fucking, like, they actually tried to. We talk about this off mic, about, I often, I often express my frustration and hatred of the QAnon people for, like, their their immense stupidity at missing the <laughs> missing the opportunity for revolutionary potential by diverting their all their like diverting all that revolutionary potential into sci-fi nonsense that makes them racist gooks. Like you people are so much closer to radicalization than, you know, insane liberals. And yet you decide to focus on like how much you hate Mexicans because they stole your job. Even though and they it, didn't. Yeah. And you then got, it, you got fired because you were drunk on the job for the second week in a row. And yeah. And then you you come up with this shit that's like about like, again, Ellen Page being a cyborg. It's like, I hate you. Elliot Page. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm wait. What is Ellen? What's Ellen's last name? DeGeneres. That's the one I was trying to yeah. say. <laughs> Elliot Page. Yeah. Um, By the way, I have a pet theory about Elliot Page, Max. Tell me if this is wrong. This is a total trans uh, digression. Okay. I think Elliot Page is America's sweetheart. I, I am a huge fan of Elliot Page. I yeah, because they came out of gay. They came out as gay like ten years ago, and it was kind of controversial. Not really controversial. It was a news item. Yeah. But I think people were mostly okay with it, right? Came out as trans recently, and people are mostly okay with it. It seems. Yeah. I'm the, sure the, the usual shit bags, but other yeah. than that, I they they have a magic power. <laughs> no, and he's. I think he's, Elliot Page is America's sweetheart. He's absolutely wonderful. Yeah. I'm I'm a huge fan of Elliot Page. Um, acting wise, super charming in anything he's in. I I, I haven't to, seen them in anything uh, in like ten years. Well, that you don't watch Umbrella Academy. Um, I'm a big fan of that. So oh, yeah. You you wouldn't like Umbrella Academy. It's one of those shows. I don't like anything with teenagers in school. It, they're not te- <laughs> they're not teenagers and they're not in school. So <laughs> Good job, Austin. <laughs> <laughs> they're all 20-somethings and they've were never technically in a school, so it's fine. But are they really is it sort of like they're in school? No. Not even close. They were abused as children in a place their abusive stepfather called the Umbrella Academy. <laughs> but you would hate it for other reasons. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> is it a TV show? It's a Netflix show. Oh, fuck that. No, but Elliot Page is great in that. I do like that um, before they came out, they had uh, him playing a straight woman in the first season. And it was the least convincing straight woman performance you've ever <laughs> seen in your life. And then in the second season, they're just like, okay, we're just going to have you play a lesbian <laughs> in this season because... Well, can't the characters be bi? You know? Yeah, but no, that's what happened. Like, yeah, they wrote, fine. they wrote her a female love interest. More characters... Because it was so obvious that they <laughs> were not into men. Yeah, in the every, first everyone knows I hate TV shows. But if I was writing a TV show... I would love to have a character have, you know, different love interests like that. From no, season and season. They, they actually have more bisexual characters. They have, fine. they have a very well-written bisexual character on Umbrella, Umbrella Academy. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very happy with that, but sorry, Elliot Page rant. <laughs> but. So yeah, listeners get back to us. Elliot Page, America's sweetheart. Yes, I think so. I think so. They have the magic touch. I don't know what it is or how, or how they got it, but they do. They have it. How do you feel about Juno? I'd have to rewatch it. But Seething hatred. Really? I can see not liking it, but like I just I don't like that type of e- indie movie. Okay, the, like the the too charming, too cutesy indie movie. Yeah, like, okay. it's like please can we just 
someone needs to get murdered. I do hate. Mi- I do hate Michael Sarah. Like <laughs> you have a very strong hatred of Michael Sarah, and it I think he's me. garbage in ninety percent of the movies he's in. Uh, Crystal Fairy is the only movie I think he was perfectly cast Never for. Even heard that of that? Did I tell you I met him? Oh wait, no, I didn't meet him. Never mind. I, I met McLovin in high school. I did. I have heard a story of somebody at the same college we both went to who met Michael Sarah. What happened? Uh, he was apparently just a gigantic asshole to him. Why? They, they were in line at like a subway in California together or something. And he was trying to be nice. Like apparently some other like people had gone up to him and he's just like, or no, no. He was like, oh, okay. I, I figured people would be like, oh, I love you in Juno. I love you in Scott Pilgrim. So I was, I went up to him like, oh, I love you in Crystal Fairy. And Michael Sarah's just like, why the fuck would you say that? <laughs> and walk away. That's kind of awesome. I kind of love that, to be honest with you. <laughs> I kind of love that. I got to be honest. That's, that's such an asshole move, dude. But no, I, I met McLovin. I met Christopher Mintz Platts. I met him at a in high school. I went to a friend's parents' house, and they were holding like a wine party. And he was just like standing on a rock outside the party as we were driving up. And one of my friends in the back of the car was like, Guys, that's McLovin. And we're like, Devon, what are you talking about? It's like, that's McLovin. And uh, I think we've told me this before. Yeah, yeah, and we forced him to walk over by himself before we did to see if it was actually him. He's just standing on a rock in the middle of nowhere. It's just like really weird. Yeah, that's where they leave him in between <laughs> movies. So yeah, he was just standing there and we talked to him. And I uh, guess he was just there to we're try reaching to the climax of the movie. Oh my god, the climax. We, d- we, of the we didn't even talk about the the racist circle of people buying the chic. Yeah. Yes, uh needless to say, interesting things to see but uh well, needless oh to say it's racist. Ah, sorry, I need to look away from the screen from all these edits cuz we can't just have them running in a straight line. We have to foo 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 foo. Yes, foo, the, foo, the foo, seed foo, foo, of foo. the the meme taken 3 scene where he <laughs> jumps over the fence is in planted in this <laughs> movie. Yeah. But, uh, you know, obviously, I think another thing you could point out about that climactic scene where he buys his daughter is, again, connecting it back to the singer at the beginning. Again, remember, he's totally okay with the sexualization and exploitation of his daughter as long as it's on his own terms. And that might sound crass to say because, obviously, it's different to be a pop star than it is to be, you know, someone in in a a sex slave. But also, we've yeah, and as I mentioned before... he saw that being a pop star is a dangerous profession. Yep. But also, like, we're playing in the reality of this movie, and the reality of this movie is not deta- it's not attached to real reality. It's all about, like, you know, impulse and fantasy. And when you look at it through that lens, really, the the difference that this movie establishes between being the pop star and the, you know, sex slave is not as great as it would seem. And the difference, ultimately, is the terms on which the sexuality is expressed. I Which just, it, Liam Neeson approves of one and disapproves of the other. I know I was dumb when I was 15, but like I remember thinking of just like, this was a well made action movie. And it's just like, I don't know if we have any teenage listeners. If you do, um, I'm not one to give advice. I'm just some dude in a podcast. But like, genuinely to you, like, I know you hear this all the fucking time and adults are annoying and shit, but like, you're not as old as you think you are, mate. And like stuff that seems like common sense to you now will seem like pure idiocy in a couple of years. That's a good thing. Yeah. And it's a good thing. You want to look back on yourself as an idiot. And yeah. And by that, I don't mean don't enjoy yourself as a teenage years, but just yeah. like be an idiot. Enjoy being an idiot, but don't pretend like you're not being an idiot, basically. Wait, how does that relate to this? It doesn't. It was just a general piece of advice. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, that's random. And it, I was saying because I thought this was a good, well-made action movie when I was 15. I mean, that's hardly a bad thing. Yeah, like, I thought 300 was awesome when it came out. Oh, yeah. We tried watching 300 for the podcast, and we couldn't even make it halfway through the movie. Because it's too embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> We've talked about this a lot off mic, about how you, like, think using the word cringe is stupid and doesn't mean anything, but you have to admit 300 is like the definition of a cringe movie, uh, right? To a degree. I, and to clarify that, I think cringe is overused to, yeah. to the point of... It's lost its meaning. To the point now it means somebody openly enjoying something on the internet, basically, and that I'm not okay with. 
I have a, the same problem, but for more reasons for people using the term autistic on the internet. Wait, what? Oh, you've what? never you've never seen that where people just like call anybody it's like an insult. Yeah, of just like people openly enjoying things. They're like, oh, I'm like fucking autistic about that. That That's, sounds like an like a the Donald. Yeah, sort of thing. I mean, they go it, like re that sort of thing. It's it's the seepage of 4chan seeping into the rest of the internet. Yeah, exactly. I I don't see that often at all, to be honest. But um, no, that's awful. Obviously, yeah, it's uh, um, utterly fucking disgusting. But what were we saying? I forget. I don't know. I three hundred. I, I almost finished this. Oh this yeah, Austin thing. made a very good cocktail. I'm jealous, honestly. But uh. We were talking about how stupid 300 was. Yeah, that movie's terrible, but it didn't stop me from thinking it was really cool when I was 10. Saw it. I remember seeing that movie. One, I was in uh, Florida visiting my friend um, during Christmas break, and they had a Disney World pass. This was the only way I got to Disney World as a kid, because I visited my friend who had like the passes for me. And They're uh, discontinuing those, those now. What? Oh, people I mean, are very upset. <laughs> I don't care. You know, fuck. I find it funny. People, people who bought a eat at Disney bounding weirdos. But no, I I was in Florida and I saw three hundred one day, and then the Zodiac the next day. <laughs> oh God, the Zodiac is amazing, Max. Have you ever seen that movie? No, I have not. That movie has one of the most blood curdling death scenes I've ever seen in cinema. It chills my spine to even think about it. That movie's amazing. We should do Zodiac. That's definitely uh, David Fincher's best movie by far. And probably one, I would say, one of the best American movies of the last 25 years. So that's a recommendation for all our, our listeners is uh, Zodiac. I'm sorry, I'm just astonished by how stupid the fact that this guy has like this weird fucking curved knife that he carries. Ugh. Whatever. It's a scimitar. It's not. Because they're Arabian or something. Oh, yeah. These are people who are Arabic. We've switched up our racism from Albanian <laughs> to Arabs now. There's a sheik on board. I mean, this, it does look like he bought this boat from Donald Trump with the white and gold everywhere. Oh, it's so tacky. That's what I hate about rich people the most is they're the tackiest and dessert. Like, they know the least what to do with their money. You know, Max? Rich people don't even do cool shit with their money. They just... They do endlessly tacky bullshit. Rich people, you suck. Let me manage your money. Daddy. Oh, my God. The ending of this movie should really be like the ending of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Because... The the most it, amazing if it ended here, like I'd be kind of okay with it, honestly. If this were a real movie, the ending should be like her faced as she's like crying and laughing and screaming into his shoulder. Yeah. And it should be like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre where Marilyn Burns, her performance in that movie is amazing. But at the end of that movie, as she escapes Leatherface, there's this amazing thing where she's like screaming and crying at the same time. And she's like laughing as she gets away, and it's like, oh, she's fucked for the rest of her life. Yeah, uh, and that's what the end of this movie should be. But no, we get the happy. This ending. seems like yeah, like that shot, the slow pull out. Oh, shot. they do live in Los Angeles. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I love that, mom. Des despite the fact that she was abducted, they're just waiting at the terminal. <laughs> and yeah, he took a private plane to get there. <laughs> he took this the, the secret billionaire plane to get yes, there. Yes, the idea that like the pair, the other the stepdad and the mom wouldn't be in Paris as well. <laughs> you can't go to Paris; it's too dangerous. <laughs> You'll be taken as well. Wait, that's what happens in the sequel, right? Famke Jensen gets yeah. taken, and then she dies in the third one. And then does the stepdad get taken? <laughs> that that's for taken four. <laughs> And then uh, in Taken 5, uh, she'll have a baby, and the baby will get taken. When does Liam Neeson get taken? Um, in the, and he gets the, rescued by U2. In, no, in the, in the spinoff, Take Him. Oh! Where she has to rescue him for once. Then That's a good one. That's we, a good one. 
We got to go down to the copyright <laughs> office to, to make sure no one gets in on that idea. Or, I, or when they inevitably remake it, we can sell the <laughs> trademark for a pretty penny. They'll they'll do the uh, Ghostbusters all female remake of Taken, yeah. and it'll be a woke version of this, but just as racist. And it'll be mm. Take Him, and it has Rebel Wilson in it just just for good measure, <laughs> <laughs> just to make me hate it more. <laughs> yes, Rebel Wilson, who uh, despite apparently having newsworthy um, weight loss. Over the last year, we'll still be doing terrible fat phobic jokes. <laughs> Every movie she's in is terrible. <laughs> Max, it's she <Shira. laughs> No, I just imagined that guy who was playing the vocal coach in the background. <laughs> it's like, hey, guys, I got cast and taken as the vocal coach. And he's not even in focus. <laughs> he's just in the back. He's just like five Boca <laughs> attached to one another moving. Yeah, that's great. Oh, oh, the movie ended. Yeah, God. What the hell? Oh, geez. We, okay, well, that was taken, everyone. I didn't even get to talk about the connection to the Western genre. Oh, well. I guess I'll just... And I, I just want to mention the note that I think it's interesting to look at the vigilante, you know, revenge genre and the different cycle of different cycles of vigilante movies throughout U.S. film history uh, as, like, an extension of the gunslinger in the Western. Because I think it's very interesting to look at, so, you know, the Western is all about those themes of authority and civilization versus rugged individualism. And the vigilante is all about that rugged individualism having to strike back against the excesses of an ineffective bureaucracy, right? An ineffective or corrupt bureaucracy. And uh, that's why I feel like the movie also has so much to do with American propaganda, and a lot of these vigilante movies end up having reactionary politics to begin with is because they are hearkening back to that Western gunslinger uh, idea. A lot of these movies, I feel like the vigilante characters are kind of like Western characters stuck in a modern world. Well, I, you know, and I get that because the the whole like appeal of the Western genre and the ennui that drives a lot of our heroes in that movie is the fact that like the government in the state is encroaching in on the last free air, the truly free areas of America and that these laws are going to bind them down and stop them from living their truly free lives. Yeah. And the vigilante movies are very similar in the same way of they're like a post-apocalyptic Western in, in the sense that the apocalypse is what you're talking about with the frontier being closed yes. down. Yeah. They're a post, they're a post West Western. Uh, yeah. And it's almost like, I've seen this compared to like, you know how cops love the Punisher? <laughs> yes. Where it's like the Punisher kill, like in the comics, like the Punisher kills cops and like it, it, it doesn't make any sense. But like the idea of that character who like he just goes, he kills the bad guys, fuck regulations, fuck use of lethal force, fuck paperwork. Yeah. He just goes and kills the bad guys. And the like, Western gunslinger. Yeah. Like, that's a great connection. Yeah. Yeah. I've never read any of the um, Punisher comics, but it, that is exactly kind of like that character, right? Because didn't he used to be a cop? Or I don't know. He used to, he's ex-military man. Yeah. But um, I do love that uh, the creator of the Punisher, the original, like the original guy who made the comics way back in the day, who's like an OG guy at Marvel, um, made a... Like a very well done Black Lives Matter Punisher skull, and has started issuing cease and desist orders to all of the companies making the thin oh, blue line stuff. Would suck. I would hate to make something that then gets, gets appropriated by these yeah, fucking no, nitwits. He he put out, a, and like if it was just Disney doing this to try to do it, no. But like, does he, does the Punisher have leftist politics? No, well, generally, no, he doesn't. Um, the Punisher, I I hate to say this is, but like. Well, all superheroes Poli are kind of fascist. Yeah, but he doesn't, like, politics isn't a thing to him. It's, like, huh. crime. It's, like, you, yeah. you've you done crime. Fascist. I will kill you. Yeah, now. yeah. fascist. All superheroes are fascist, I think. He doesn't, uh, but there there is a rather famous thing where, like, he runs into cops, and cops are, like, talking about how they idolize him, and he's like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, he's aware of the fact that he's breaking the law and that, like, he needs to be brought in, and he's like, 
no, you're, I do my job so that you can continue to exist in yours. You, you, you do not idolize me. Do not, you yeah. should hate people like me. No, maybe we'll get to do a, a really good superhero movie one day that gets to the heart of like the fascism and reactionary tendencies of all superheroes. I well, think. Well, first they have to make it, but until then, well, this is called been... Mister Freedom. So okay, we'll get to it at some point on the Spectator Film Podcast, which yes. you have been listening to. Um, if you want to listen to more of us, you can find us on Stitcher, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you listen to wherever other podcasts. podcasts are sold. Yes. Austin, any final words? Uh, spectatorfilmpodcast.com. That's our website. Uh, you can also follow us on our letterbox, and definitely don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, we don't post a ton online, but if you reach out to us, we will respond. 100% of the time. Uh, your comments and suggestions and everything mean the world to us, and it's the entire reason we keep doing this. And so you know thank what, Max, you so much. Once again, we forgot to thank Alicia at the start of the show. So we're going to do it again. And we're <laughs> at the end of the show for our amazing Carnival of Souls covers. The thing and is, the wonderful... No one's going to make it to this point in the episode. This no. is like an hour and a half in. So I'm going to set an alarm on my phone for next <laughs> week to thank Alicia at the beginning of the show. By the time we finally remember to do it, we'll have gotten her to do another one. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye.